me ask you my, my last real practical question. When, when I send somebody to any of you guys, um, you're looking at individual patients. We've got two FDA-approved mm -hmm. drugs. How do you decide for that individual patient? Do I choose one versus the other? Is there certain patterns? I mean, how do you just, from a real practical standpoint, how do you decide with the patient sitting in front of you, what, which one, you gotta decide which one to start. It eventually comes down to your decision, Marcia. So how do you, how do you think through that decision? The answer is yes. I thought so. <laughs> and, and, I, and I would only assume that Eric and Frank would agree to yes. yes so how do, you, how do you think about this? So, I mean, the first thing you have to understand is 100% of my patients will get both drugs. So that's the first thing. So then, um, for the most part, um, it will depend on um, sometimes comorbidities. If they're over 60, I might consider, because of the data, I might consider doing levatinib first in the over 60 population. But then on the other side of that, we have the story that um, levatinib works very well in second line. And remembering this, we want to make this cancer into a chronic disease. Mm -hmm. And so I am lining up, not usually just two, because I'll have three or four other clinical trials after that. I'm going to try to take as many act active agents as I can and extend them as long as possible. So um, if I feel that I don't really know exactly what the activity of serafinib is after lymvatinib, it's data we badly need. Um, because you can't really, since the lymvatinib patients were clearly sicker, People's experience right now giving serafinib after linvatinib may not work because the patient yeah. population was so different. So when people say, oh, yes. I've given serafinib after linvatinib, anybody who's saying that now did it, it's not objective. It's no. not really, it's not apples to apples. So we can't say that. But, you know, we do know that if we give serafinib first, then follow it with linvatinib, that they can get two long yeah. periods. So, um, you know, all of these things, again, will go into it. And there's not really a right answer right now, mm -hmm. but we will have to... Um, do it to the to the patient, um, mm. and response will play into it. I need response, so I might take one back. Eric, how do you think about it? I mean, it's pretty much similar to just what Marsha just said. I mean, to me, actually, majority of patients, I'm going to start with serapin first. I think, you know, the data is that levatinib works pretty close in the second line as it does in the first line setting. We know that it works in the second line setting after VEGF TKI. With serafinib, it was a first-line study. We know it works in the first line. We do not know that it really works in the second line after levatinib. So in the majority of my patients, the way I look at it is that it's not a, a sprint. It's going to be a marathon, mm -hmm. and I want to be able to go from one drug to another to another. And it's very rare in thyroid cancer that I'm only going to be able to get one drug, and that's it. So in the majority of my patients, I'll start with serafinib, and then I'll go with levatinib. The big exception is going to be the patient with very aggressive disease. So I've had someone who's become symptomatic very quickly. It's a very aggressive, almost near anaplastic type of disease. Then I'm going to go with, I think, the drug that's the best. And I think when, even though they have not been compared head to head, when you look at the phase three data, both studies, Levatin looks like a better drug. So to me, in terms of in terms, in terms of, of response rate, in terms of response rate, on. in terms of progression-free survival. You know, it is not a head to head comparison. You have to take that as a caveat. But when you look at, you know, comparing one to another, um, like the two phase three studies, that response rate is much, much higher with levatinib. The progression free survival looks larger. So if I have a really, really aggressive disease, I want to use levatinib first. But majority of my patients, I usually see before yeah, that sure. happens. Yeah. And I'm going to start with serafinib first, followed by levatinib. Frank, where are you on this? Yeah, I. Could echo the same thing. I mean, I've had patients where I've given levatinib and then given serafinib, they crash. They just don't do as well. And I know it's just my experience, but it's it's hard to tell. You know, based on the biology of the tumor, perhaps I, I don't know. Or clinically, are they just not as fit as they would have been? Um, but I do the same thing. I start with serafinib first, and even data from Marsha and from Eric about adding mTOR inhibitors. I will start with serafinib, and then with progression, I'll oftentimes, if I can petition to get everolimus, for example, mm -hmm. um, based on their data, I'll add everolimus before I actually go to lymvatinib. Mm -hmm. um, but if a patient, again, needs a, a response right away because the disease burden is big or there are a lot of symptoms, then I'll start with lymvatinib. I think there's a couple other things, yeah, that I want to add. I, I don't have a rule of always serafinib first. You know, I, I agree with everybody that you look at, um, you know, the burden of disease, the timing that you need, the shrinkage, as well as the comorbidities of that patient, right, and, and their lifestyle. Are they a person that's high risk for hand, foot, laborers, you know, doing this? Or are they somebody who fatigue really will, you know, crunch their day and, you know, or hypertension is going to be really bad. And I think you have to take the whole picture, quality of life, symptoms, comorbidities, burden of disease, everything that's been said to help you choose that drug and, and what's right for that patient. 
Um, I, don't, I don't think we have a rule until we have that data because like it's been pointed out, we don't have that head to head. You know, we don't know the right answer. You can get nice shrinkage with both drugs depending on if you choose the right patient population. Right. So right. Yeah. I think the and jury's still out. And I mean, even in serafinib, right. the phase three had a response rate of 12.2%. I will point out that 90% of the you know, the people who give this regularly are probably getting a higher response rate yeah. than that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in the phase three, we were getting a high, we were getting like a 20 to 30% percent, response right. rate. So it really is unclear that if we did a head to head where it would, would they're probably closer together than they look if you were to just look I think at you're the, probably right. I mean, this is a good threes. problem to have, right? Yeah. We've got yeah. two yeah. drugs two that we drugs. know are active drugs. They both improve progression-free survival. And then we're doing right where we started the beginning of this talk. How do we figure out the right drug for the right patient at the right time? I mean, one thing I do want to put down is while we do have two FDA approved drugs and they're good drugs, neither of them are great drugs. And we and it just, it just has to push out that clinical trials is still to me the way that you have to really think about going. And even if it means in the first line setting, if you have the right clinical trial, that it's something you, you haven't happened to consider. Um, so I think we're still, we still have a long way to go on thyroid cancer, and that despite the fact of having two FDA approved drugs, doesn't mean those are the only two ways that we should be going about it. That if there's a clinical trial available, a lot of times we have to think about that even in the first line setting. Right, and the way that we, ex oh, sorry. The way that we explain it to patients is that they're like, well, you have these FDA approved trials, why should I do this research? Because you never know when that drug or that combination of drugs okay. will be that cure or will do better than this. So FDA approved drugs are always available. Right? So as long as it's the right setting.